Hello everyone, it's so great to see all of you again and welcome to our Kai Work weekly conversation. If it's possible, please turn on your camera. We'd love to see everyone. And I would also like to thank all of the other technical program chairs, as Max, Navina, Erin, and Shudan, as well as our student volunteers, Alberta and Isabel and Neville. And we also thank NSF for partially funding this event. So some logistics. The first part of the event will be recorded. So you'll be a 30 minutes conversation between me and Hai Yi. And uh, we very much look forward to questions for, for the, from the audience. So please type your questions into the chat. And please also stay with us for the second part. Following the conversation, we will continue with, with the informal discussion among all, all of us here. So right now, I'd like to welcome our guest today, Hai Yi Zhu. So Hai Yi is uh, an as associate professor of human computer interaction and the director of HCI undergraduate programs at Carnegie Mellon University. She received a bachelor's degree in computer science from Tsinghua University and a master's degree and PhD degree in computer science uh, in human computer interaction from Carnegie Mellon University. Hai Yi has received multiple NSF awards and several paper awards in venues such as Kai CSAW and Human Factors and also an Alan Newell Award for Research Excellence. And today our conversation will be about improving human AI partnership in child welfare, understanding worker practices, disagreements, and desires for algorithmic decision support. So welcome, Hai Yi. So I guess my first question will be, can you just tell us a little bit more about your work in this area? How can you augment human decision making in those high stakes social contexts and why is that important? Yeah, sure. And first of all, thank you, Toby, for the introduction. And this is my great pleasure to speak here and talk to people. And about why I think it's important to understand the use of AI in social work. Uh, may I maybe share a figure? Sure. Okay, so if someone can maybe give me access to share a figure. Okay, sounds good. And then, um, yeah, okay. So can people see this one, uh, see my interface? Yes, see my yes, map. Okay. Yeah, so actually this is a map. And this is a map was generated by ACLU in 2021. This shows how the algorithmic tools in social work are beginning to spread across the country. We can look at the states that are colored in green and in yellow. The green states are the ones that are currently using or moving towards using the algorithmic tool. And the yellow states are the ones that have tried, have explored, but may have decided not to use the tool. And in fact, yeah, we can see that a lot of tools are actually rapidly spreading across the country. And most of these tools are inspired by a single tool that was first de developed and deployed in Allegheny County, the county where the city of Pittsburgh is. So we want to study the tool, specifically the tool used in Allegheny County called Allegheny County Family Screening Tool. And because we believe that actually uh, understanding the use of tools is important, we are really in this critical stage to understand the use of the tool so that we can maybe inform the trajectories of using this kind of tool in social work. So um, yeah, let me see, I will stop sharing. And so that's why we think that studying the yeah, use of AI tools in social work is quite important. Can I just tell a bit more about what do those tools do and how are they actually used in the context? Sure. Yeah. So again, maybe the flow chart will, uh, will help. So right now, the, uh, um, the Allegheny Family Screening Tool, FST, is used to um, assist or help social workers make screening decisions 
So this is uh, basically the workflow. So when the social worker receive a maltreatment referral call and the hotline call screeners, they will uh, collect information and uh, gather all the related information, which includes things like, for example, family history, and then the AFST output, AFST's prediction of to what extent the family or the, the kids are actually in risk. And it specifically it's used to predict the long-term risk of home removal and the risk of re-referral. And mm -hmm. they will also collect other information like car, uh, current allegation and use other tools. And um, with all this information and the social workers are, are making the screening decisions or recommendations, they will recommend whether this case should be screened out or um, which means that no investigation is needed, or mm -hmm. it should be screened in for investigation, or they should have a field screen for to collect more information. And after that, there will be a core screening supervisor who makes a final decision. So this is the workflow of how FST is, is used. So as we can see that the FST is not used to replace any human judgment but the FST is used to augment and help uh, humans and social workers to make the decisions. And this is actually the interface um, like uh, shown to the social worker. Uh, the FST tool outputs a prediction on scale of 1 to 20 and it made to capture the future risk. Well, I guess in your study, like do you have a sense of how those social workers and supervisors actually interpret this result and uh, take this result into their decision making process. Right, that's exactly the study we did. And we did a, a field study and we did a contextual inquiry and we paid two field visits and to actually go to the workplace to see how the cost screeners are actually making decisions. And we will uh, observe them making decisions. We sometimes will follow, uh, ask follow-up questions to understand how they actually integrate FST uh, scores um, in their decision-making and uh, what information they use to make the uh, final screening decisions. And um, in addition to this contextual inquiry, we also conduct uh, like semi-structured interview after the visit and talk to the individual workers and then uh, reflect on like the, uh, the process of using these tools. And we also conduct a data analysis and we collect uh, all the historical, like four years of, uh, of historical data and uh, looking at the cost screeners decisions, uh, FST recommendations and a lot of other uh, related outcomes. I see, so can you share a little bit more about the main findings from that study? Yeah, of course. So the main findings for, for the qualitative study, and um, again, I guess I can show this very quick uh, slide, but I can uh, talk through uh, these findings. So for the qualitative findings, what we found is that uh, workers' reliance on their FST recommendations is basically guided by their perceptions of the model capabilities, limitation, organizational pressure incentives, and also a misalignment between the aggressive prediction and their own decision making. So specifically, the workers, they are actually given very minimal information about the FST. So according to what we learned from the agency, they intentionally sort of hide how the FST scores were generated because in part they want to sort of prevent, avoid, uh, or discourage any gaming behaviors. Mm -hmm. However, as a result, the workers have to like sort of come up with their own strategies to learn about the models. So they actually play this guessing game with each other, trying to figure out, yeah, what is the, yeah, this particular case? Uh, case what, what do you predict the risk score is? And by playing this game, uh, games, they actually develop their own ability or try informally learn how, to, uh, how the FST scores are generated. And as a result, they actually form the very very sophisticated yet imperfect beliefs about the model behaviors. And they use this to uh, actually calibrate their reliance on the tools. 
And specifically, we want to point out, out that the workers actually identify the FST limitation. For example, they clearly see the FST will over or underestimate like risk levels for certain kind of cases. And they also see there is like racial disparities and uh, in the screen rate and in the error rate in the FST predictions. So they actually intentionally adjust the FST limitation when they are making decisions. They're trying to correct for some of the systematic biases in the data reporting and the algorithmic predictions. So this is the first set of findings. It's like basically uh, how, uh, to answer your question, how they interpret these findings. So they uh, or in, how they understand these FST scores. They are given very minimum training, minimal support to understand score, but they develop their own strategies and they trying to use this uh, their understandings to guide their use of FST recommendation. And um, another thing we found is actually they also uh, there are some like organizational pressures around like the uh, use of these uh, use of FST. Um, actually, uh, a lot of literatures are trying to treat the reliance of AI as a matter of trust. However, our findings surface, uh, surface the importance of considering the sometimes the organizational context. So in the FST context and the workers, they are, their actions, behaviors, recommendations are closely monitored by the organization, by the agency. So they will monitor their performance in terms of uh, to what, uh, how frequently, for example, they disagree with the FST scores. So mm -hmm. they do not want to be perceived to disagree with the FST too often. So this will, will like actually constrain them. Sometimes they are less likely to uh, override uh, the FST recommendation, even though that they might against their like best judgment. Um, and actually, yeah. Very yeah. true. I think I've already heard so many interesting things mm -hmm. about the current practice. So you said the system provided minimal information because I, I when i saw a screenshot it's basically like a score on a scale of zero right. to 20. is that like the only information that's provided yes the that's the only information they get and they have no training about what no features are used so yeah, they, 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 they even they, don't, they have no idea what information went into the algorithm right 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 they have some guess but they okay. do not for know for sure yeah what are the features used for uh, by the predictive model for example. Do we know what information went into that model? So, sorry, do, do I? We, yeah, do you know? Of course I know. Yeah, <laughs> we have, we know exactly, yeah, okay. how the information, the what the, they use hundreds of features okay. and they're all administrative data and they oh. have uh, features about the family history and okay. uh, primarily is, uh, using the information about the, how the families are interacting with the child welfare agency. And they also use a lot of their uh, actually uh, public service usage. Okay. So a lot of these, for example, whether the um, uh, the child or the family previous use any like a public uh, support or use have like a food stamps, et cetera. Is that like a black box model or is that like more like a rule based or decision tree type of model? So it is um there um I think that they have multiple versions of these models. And uh, I believe the model that we look at, the version one, which was deployed from 2016 to 2018, is basically a regression model. So it's a yeah, it's a linear model, and they use yeah hundreds of features, and they trained on the historical data, uh, and to use to predict the long term like uh, um, home removal, whether the kids will have this risk of uh, yeah will, will be removed from uh, their home uh, like in two years. So these information, I have to say that they are actually public to the public or the researchers. They have like uh, documentations about how the tool was developed. However, the social workers, the frontline workers will give them minimum information or training. Yeah. And because uh, you also mentioned the frontline workers also often have very inaccurate mental models of what those models do. So I wonder what are some common misconceptions they have about the model? 
So yeah, maybe I can also uh, stop sharing so we can see each other. And um, so, uh, for example, um, the workers do not know if they're, uh, they do not know for sure if FST actually take into account the allegation information, so the content, the actual content of the allegation. So that's something they they are not very sure and to what extent it's used. Of course, they also do not know for sure how exactly the FST actually calculates their scores. So that's why they actually, uh, like I mentioned, so they have to guess its behavior. However, they, they don't, yeah, they, they sort of already figure out sort of, yeah, have a pretty good sort of estimation often time about uh, cases like this. Well, this will be treated as a high risk case or medium risk case or low risk case. I see. Another thing you mentioned that really stood out to me was that you mentioned the workers are actually aware of many biases that the model has mm -hmm. and will consciously adjust the decisions mm -hmm. to, to, to for those biases when they are making decisions. Mm -hmm. So can you tell more, can you tell us more about that process and how do, how do, they, how do they come to that practice? Yeah, so so first of all, I want to show the numbers, and this is actually some quantitative number to actually support some of the qualitative evidence. So, or, or can people see my screen? You can, right? Uh, yes, yes, we can see your screen. Oh, okay, okay. So here is actually we we look at the uh, both the screen rate and which is yeah whether the uh, kids were screened in or not. Now, the proportion of the kids were uh, screened in. And we look at the both the, or the FST only, which is FST's recommendation, and know that this is a hypothetical case. Even uh, in, in real world, in practice, FST is only used to support human make the, the final decision. But we have this like sort of a hypothetical scenario. If FST is only decision maker, and then uh, what is the screen rate? And we also look at the final decision, which is worker FST decision, like after the work, uh, uh, worker look at FST and make the final decision. And on the left here is the screen rate, and we calculate screen rate for black children, white children, and calculate the disparity. On the right, we look at the accuracy, and then uh, we look at accuracy for uh, for FST only worker FST on black children, white children, and calculate disparity. And here, what we can see clearly is that actually FST only decisions were more racially disparate than the worker FST decisions. And specifically, if we look at the yeah, screen rate sort of disparity, FST alone would have like uh, would had like about 20% of a racial disparity. Mm -hmm. However, like the worker FST eventually, the workers actually reduced the disparity to 9%. Wow. So they indeed like reduced the, um, yeah, the, the disparity. And the, uh, the way how they do it is actually they, uh, disagree and override the FST's recommendations. And in the paper, we talk a lot of uh, a lot about the mechanisms. And um, so one thing is like they told us that they are making holistic decisions. So they are making use of all the information they have access to and to make holistic decisions about whether this kid is in immediate risk or not. So they they believe that they have uh, indeed they have access to information more than what the FST model have access to, and the FST model primarily have ac only have access to an administrator, but the work workers are having a lot uh, a lot more information. So they say that they are not trying to sort of reduce disparity. So they are this is not their explicit goal, but by making holistic decisions and they are able to like actually uh, assess the actual risk and as a result and they reduce the disparity to nine percent but there is also some workers say that they will intentionally sort of see any particular cases they they believe is or fst over or underestimate the risk then they will correct it so for uh, yeah and another thing they talk about is actually they do this collaborative like this 
decision making. They will have uh, a lot of worker will talk to each other, and they are in this very uh, yeah small workplace, and then right. sit next to each other, talk to each other. They think that maybe, but we don't know have the strong evidence. But they believe that sometimes they will get the, a second pair of eyes looking at the cases. This process might also help with uh, uh, disparity reduction. They also the workers are working with the supervisors. So uh, in the paper, we talk uh, very specifically about how they actually, um, what they did actually led to this uh, reduction of the disparity. That's very interesting. So I wonder like from your perspective, like moving forward, what are some opportunities to facilitate the more effective human AI collaborations or human AI partnerships in such context? Yeah, so um, we believe that there, um, there are implications actually um, on multiple levels. So uh, first of all, maybe there should be like an interface or like a training support to the workers and the workers should have more uh, like training and uh, better understanding how FST currently all these kind of the models are uh, are working and what kind of the model or uh, how the model generates the outputs. And we also think that, yeah, there, uh, there should be during the model development process and the social workers or these frontline workers should be like engaged in the early stages. Uh, right now, a lot of these models are only deployed, uh, uh, once the model are completely de developed and they will consult, for example, frontline worker, other frontline workers to use it. However, this particular tool actually FST, there is a misalignment and social workers believe that there is a misalignment with the prediction target and the actually the objective of their own work target or their own like a task objective. So the, their job is to try to assess the immediate risk of the kids, but the tool is trying to do predict some long-term risk like the, the certain outcomes in two years. So there is this misalignment and between the prediction and the, what they are actually need, uh, do, uh, what, what the worker actually doing. So these kind of things could be potentially avoided if the workers were like uh, consulted early on to understand what they need. So uh, bringing workers actually to uh, in the early stages of the design process, instead of just bringing them as the offsorts or like just the, the pilot testing the interface, I think that's important. Um, and finally, we think that there should be organizational support and to help the worker, empower the workers and help them to use their own human judgment to uh, calibrate the reliance and empower them to do that. And right now, what we're seeing that is actually they, are, they were not empowered, at, actually their, their performance were monitored and they were really afraid that if they disagree with the algorithm too much and what kind of the consequence they might have on their own performance metrics. So, and so uh, we believe that there should be like, uh, but actually our work already showed that the workers can use their own judgment to reduce their racial disparity. There is another piece of work actually uh, done by some collaborators at CMU, also found that human workers were able to detect the errors in the FST models. So overall, we see that, yeah, there is a uh, human should be, the frontline workers should be empowered uh, to use their own knowledge judgment to correct uh, the limitations of the AI tools. But right now, it's, it's not there yet. So I think that's another thing about uh, there is implications about developing a better organizational context to support the workers. That's very interesting. I think a lot of what you have just discussed are kind of coming up again and again in our weekly high work conversations, right? Like how can we develop this future workforce that can collaborate effectively with AI, can actually understand the how AI works, the biases of AI, and how can they accommodate those limitations of AI in the work practice. But also, I think one that's super interesting in what you have mentioned is how can we enable those workers to be an active participant in the design of the AI so they can be with the effective stakeholders in mm -hmm. like a participatory design process so that their values, their needs, and their concerns can be incorporated in that design decision. So my next question is, 
because I think I think I think the issue you discuss is not limited to just uh, child fair ch- child welfare workers, right? I mean, as we're seeing more instances, more sectors in our in our workforce where workers are in a situation where they need to collaborate with AI or algorithms in making decisions. So I wonder, what are some other areas or other application domain that you think your findings can generalize to? And what are some findings that you think are unique for the, for the child welfare or for the social work domain? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So, um, for example, the disparity results. So we, we found that actually when workers have work with uh, uh, algorithms that are actually has a huge disparity and they like uh, increase it, reduce it, we found it's like the workers reduce the disparity. Um, it's unclear to what extent is this, for example, this particular result will be generalized to other setting. What we already actually see that, for example, in criminal justice, and people find a completely opposite pattern. Actually, when judges working with maybe a algorithms with a huge disparities and apparently they didn't reduce the the, um, the overall kind of that they didn't reduce the disparity. So uh, some of the uh, specific finding, and I think we could, um, it, future work, I think needs to be conducted to see to what extent they are actually uh, generalized to other setting or other type of work or other sectors. But overall, we do see that, yeah, some of the challenges of uh, provide more trainings to the frontline workers who have to work with the AI tools, better empower them and uh, get, engage people in the early design process and what is the best way to uh, actually support them. Uh, I think these are the overall challenges I believe are quite generalizable to other contexts. So, um, but again, yeah, I'm glad to see there are a lot of uh, like work actually are emerging in the field and people are more and more like, uh, yeah, concerned and I start to study the related questions in other domains. Thanks. I, I guess my last question before we enter the second stage is a bit about the practice you have been working with like actual like community organizations on this topic. That's one thing I really appreciate about your work is you actually work very closely with those partners. So I wonder what tips or experience can you share on how we as SI researchers can effectively collaborate with all those stakeholders to learn about their practical practical challenges and to maximize our like the actual real world impact of our work in this area. Right. Um, I think so. Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. And um, when when we work with any particular given domain, for example, when we are working like a child welfare, and uh, I also noticed Michael has this question about yeah, uh, involving workers and also involving their community members. So, oh, by the way, just first to uh, quickly answer Michael's question, and we can of course we can later discuss more. Is that we also did some work with community members, uh, directly talk to the family and directly talk to the parents and kids, and. and and advocacy groups. So that's in another uh, work that we are actually doing that. But for this kind of work, yes. So we have to work closely with the uh, relevant stakeholders and they are like a frontline workers, agency, the leader, uh, agency leaders, the in-house like developer teams, community members. And it takes time to build the partnership. So it also takes time to create uh, effort to maintain <laughs> the relationship. So uh, there is no one fits all like sort of solution for it. It's really domain specific. And then it also depends on like who you work with, who, who you collaborate with, etc. So um, I also think there's something we learn in like for them, how to build a partnership in child welfare <laughs> might not necessarily be generalized to other domain. So yeah, but overall, I think that yeah, a close engagement with a relevant stakeholder is key to this kind of uh, research work. Great, thanks for sharing the tip. 
And with that, I would like to thank Haiyi for joining us for today. And uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Then we will have the 30 minutes of free informal discussion time. So Alberta can just stop recording and everyone can just feel free to join the discussion either through the chat or just unmute yourself and uh, participate in the discussion.